So Kathleen and Debbie lost her mom, Pauline, on March 6th of 2020. Nicole passed on New Year's Eve of 2020. We had a visit from the police at 2.30 a.m. New Year's Day. It was a rookie female officer and she was fighting back the tears. And she had to tell us Nicole passed and it was an overdose. We learned later it was fentanyl poisoning. So we were all dealing with COVID at the time and we were unable to have um, a service for Pauline or Nicole because everything was in lockdown and you know there were all kinds of options. I heard about live stream and then I heard a, you know it became this year of Zoom, right? So I couldn't imagine a funeral over Zoom. So we just had some friends over and now it's time that we celebrate and honor Pauline's wishes and, and Nicole and, and honor them today. I'd like to thank Nicole's close friends are all here. She loved you guys. And Nicole's cousin, John, her husband, Jason, our cousin, Julie, Kathy's sister, Debbie, and her husband, Jack, and my cousin, Mark, and Michelle. Um, I pretty much just introduced our entire family. It's pretty small, somewhat dysfunctional. There's a whole lot of crazy, but there's a lot of love. So my theme for today is life after death. This is our story of addiction and our journey and the loss of our daughter. Every story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. For us, our story has a beginning, a middle, and now a new beginning. There's hope that by sharing this story, we might bring peace to others that are traveling the same journey. Grief travels our souls and it's an unwelcome friend. If you look around you, everybody in this room will experience grief. It hits in waves and they're unexpected and it could be brought on by a memory or a song while you're driving in your car, or even one of those public Thanksgiving commercials. I think they're the worst. Um, when the waves of sadness seem unbearable, and they do, they always break for a moment of calm and joy. Those moments fill your heart and allow you to travel yet one more day. Everyone travels grief alone, and even though Kathleen and I share the same loss, our journey and milestones are so different. It's a very personal journey and that's true for everyone, but in the end, the level of one's grief is really related to the amount of love that they share for the lost loved one. And in the end, we all learn to live with and through grief. So in everyone's journey, everyone will someday find a sense of peace. And I hope that's through a spiritual awakening. Mine happened long before Kathleen's. Um, I'll talk about both of our journeys because I'll speak on Kathleen's behalf today. Mine started in 2003. We lost two very dear friends to murder. That was something you see on the news every day, but it just doesn't happen to you, right? I had always believed in God, but the death of our friends, well, God and I weren't really on the best of terms. We didn't talk for a while. I was pretty angry and I made it personal. What I learned is he was always there. Then came addiction, oh boy. Nicole was a recruiter at K-Force at Chris's head. That's a pretty intense job, it's straight commission, so it's a tough gig at best. Most people don't cut straight commission jobs. At 28 years old, she was making six figures and far surpassed anything that I had accomplished at that age. When I was 28, Kathleen and I had just met. I had long hair and a beard. I was playing music full time for a living. That's what I did. I had a cool Jeep. I had a Hobie Cat sailboat and I was kind of like the Bohemian lifestyle. So I really wish Nicole would have known the hippie version of me long ago instead of the stressed out corporate version of me. Perhaps she would have backpacked through Europe or tended bar on the islands and things might have been different, but we won't know. She was a really difficult child. Part of it was because she was incredibly smart, very tough, very type A, perfect for sales and tough on a parent. So to her friends, she was everybody's therapist, everybody's counselor and the go two person for drama. And let me tell you, a, a teen and 20 something females, life is all drama. <laughs> in the end, she could never help herself. I can recall the very day and moment that we learned of addiction. I was at work, I came out of a meeting and my phone was ringing and it was Mandy. 
And she said, it's Nicole, it's drugs, it's really bad, you gotta go over there. Her friends were there with us. She lost her job at Cape Force and with addiction, people that travel this journey know that there's always a story. And denial is probably the strongest attribute for somebody that's dealing with addiction. We never saw it coming. She had a car accident in 2004 and then came Oxy. Remember 2004, because I'll circle back to that. It's a really important um, time frame on how we got here and why I'm standing up here today. Our life became hell. It was rehab, it was relapse, it was more rehab, it was more relapse, it was chaos. 15 years of that. Kathleen and I started to isolate. We stopped seeing our friends because a lot of them didn't understand or were judgmental or it was just too hard to be around. So how could this happen in the call? I still ask that question. Um, I remember the exact day of my actual awakening and that was in 2008. I was in business travel with a good friend of mine. Um, he's a coworker from South Florida. His name's Mick. Um, cool guy, larger than life. We were in California, we finished our day and we're walking back to the hotel room. And he said, uh, are you okay? He goes, dude, you're not yourself. He goes, a lot of people noticed. And he goes, and even people you don't wanna notice like your manager. So he said, you wanna grab a burger and a beer and talk? So I shared, he listened. After a few hours, he said, have you ever thought of talking to God? I didn't even know he was a spiritual person. I said, well, we're not on the best of terms right now. And he said, dude, this is really heavy lift. You can't do it on your own. He goes, just talk to him, ask for comfort and guidance. What do you have to lose? So I agreed. And then he said, talking to him is only part of it because you have to listen. If you don't listen, you'll never hear. I thought about that, how profound it was. And then I thought, <laughs> about all the conversations I've had with my lovely wife where she thinks I'm listening, but I don't hear. Um, it's kind of a guy thing, so you guys can help me out here. I think I kind of step in some of them. Um, so Mick said, it's not like you're sitting in the parking lot and God comes in this booming voice and says, Scotty, it's God. He goes, it doesn't happen that way. He said he speaks through actions, events, tender mercies, and through people like me. That was my awakening. So God spoke to Kathleen and I just before Nicole passed. And it was an event, like Mick had said. We had moved Nicole into our house in Tampa. We were still up north. We thought she was doing well, but in our hearts we knew something wasn't good. There's too many signs. And with addiction, these aren't little signs. They're like billboards on 275, they're huge. Um, so we stayed until mid-December, and when we came home, neither of us wanted to believe that she was this sick, and she was so sick. I mean, it, it was bad. Um, we didn't see her much. She was living in her house. She was up all night, slept all day. When we did see her, she was on the patio texting, and there wasn't much of a conversation happening. But we wanted to spend Christmas Eve with Jack and Debbie, and we wanted to go south and see the kids on Christmas Day, and we did that. Nicole didn't want to go. She was, she was using them. She was hours away from withdrawal. So Christmas morning, we went down, we had a great time with Jack and Debbie. Christmas morning, we stopped at Sarasota Veterans Cemetery because that's uh, where my parents are laid to rest and we visited them. It was a beautiful morning. My nav took us through the middle of the state of Florida because of the heavy traffic. So if you've ever driven through the middle of the state of Florida, it's nothing but brush and palm trees and cows and there's not much there, it's not very pretty. We saw zero traffic. We drove probably an hour and didn't see anything. And then all of a sudden, Kathy said, stop, did you see that? Turn around. And we did, and there was an older SUV that had rolled over and was in a swampy area and it was upside down, the windows were broken out. There were clothes thrown all over, um, pillows and shoes and towels, and it was pretty obvious that the couple were living out of their car. There was a bloody pit bull running around and she looked just like Nicole's Lucy. The girl was really badly cut and the guy was in bad shape. He had been thrown from the car, he was laying next to the car and gas was leaking out next to him. So I'm in like panic, I've seen enough 
Chicago Fire episodes to know that if you move somebody and they have a broken neck, you probably kill them. So I didn't know what to do. We called 911. It took about 20 minutes to get there. Um, so I plugged the gas leak with some socks, and the guy was pretty bad off. His, your leg doesn't, your foot doesn't, yeah, it was, it was not good. I tried to talk to the girl, and she was about Nicole's age, had similar hair color, and was about the same height. And she was out of control, and she kept trying to crawl back through the glass. And she crawled back through, and she was cutting her neck. Her legs were cut, her arms were cut, and she was crawling in the truck. And you could smell the oil, the engine was ticking, and we're just, I, I was just I, freaking out. I didn't know what to do. So I, I grabbed her by the arm, and I pulled her, and then she started yelling. She said, where are my pills? I need my pills. And my heart sank. I put towels on her legs and I told her to hold it to stop the bleeding, but she kept going back into the car. EMS and police came and the first thing they did is take care of the dog. So I was happy about that. We're dog people. And then the officer said, you may have saved a life today. Merry Christmas. Six days later, Nicole passed. Then it came to me that God was showing Kathleen and I Nicole's path. This is her path. She was too sick to handle her addiction. She couldn't handle it. And she was in too much pain and she'd been fighting so hard for so long. And he showed us her path as if it were a movie and to help us understand why he would take her and why he would take her from her pain. Kathleen's spiritual awakening happened just recently and it was much better. So she had been grieving and depressed since before Pauline passed. Addiction and failing parents really put a toll on you. So, and Kathy's always been kind of shy. She's been pretty introverted since addiction. Um, so we took a trip to New Orleans if you're going to have a spiritual awakening, I highly recommend New Orleans. <laughs> I mean, why would you do it in Zephyr Hills or something? <laughs> so we were in a historic hotel and they had a rooftop pool. Um, it gets, it stays late because it's central time. So we were up at the pool. I came back down to the room and Kathy was there by herself. They closed the bar. There was nobody at all. Sun was still shining and, and uh, there was a historic cathedral and the bells were ringing every half hour and there was nobody around at all. She came back in the room and said, I talked to God. That was the first since Nicole passed. Like me, Kathy, Kathy was really angry at God. For the past 17 years, she's prayed for Nicole's recovery and Nicole died. So she said she forgave God and then realized all the blessings that we have every day. So our life had two sides. Part of our life has been hell like nobody ever can imagine. The other part has been all these blessings. So we now have our life together. It's not with Nicole. She's at peace. We can move on forward without the chaos and the worry. And Nicole would want that for us. So we went to dinner and Kathy had a spirit child connection. And I think this is a great story. Um, she met a woman, young girl, who was an old soul. We had dinner and we were walking club to club and listening to all this jazz music. It was really cool. We stopped at a hotel and I kind of lost Kathleen. I'm going, where's she going? There's people all over. So I looked through the window and she's sitting at a high top table with this really cool girl. And this girl's like a 20 something flower child. Um, they talked for over an hour and there was a true connection and I don't think it was a coincidence. Um, I was wearing a Memphis drum t-shirt. so. Um, she said, well, my boyfriend's a drummer and he plays all over New Orleans, so let me text him. So he came and we talked for a long time. Um, the plan is for them to come and visit us up north this summer. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it was a co coincidence. I think it was kind of part of the plan. Mm -hmm. So Kathy and I talked a, lo a lot about things that week in New Orleans. We had a lot of conversations about things, about Nicole. And, and I told her, I said, look, I talked to Nicole. I talked to my best friend, Jerry. I talked to my friend, Dan. Can I talked to my parents and she was just looking at me. I, I talk to them when I walk the dog or I'm driving in the car. I always do. And Kathleen said, well, I always talk to God during her journey through addiction. He was my right hand man. But after 
her awakening, this was the first time that she spoke to Nicole. She told me how good it felt. And she said, I'm having dreams for the first time about Nicole in a year and a half. So we got home and we unpacked and we're hanging out watching TV and I had the AC on a little bit cold and Kathy goes, I'm, I'm cold, I gotta go in the closet and get a sweater and get something to wear. And she uh, said it was almost like Nicole just said, Mom, here's my red sweater, put it on. Kathy was not able to wear that red sweater before. It was too difficult. She's wearing it today. It smells like Nicole. And it's going to be stored in a plastic bag so that scent remains. And she'll wear it. She wants to be close and wear it during Christmas. So addiction. Um, I'm, I'm not going to sugar, sugarcoat this. This is the elephant in the room. There is judgment. And there is so much judgment. Um, I had this conversation in our meeting early on, um, and a, a young woman said it best. She goes, people think of addicts as the homeless guy on the street under the bridge with a sign. They don't see my 45-year-old husband that has two Escalades at home on Bayshore, four kids, and is losing everything we work for because he's in a halfway house. And it's all because of a weekend football action injury that resulted in back surgery and an addiction to oxy and he's lost everything. That's true, there's still a stigma that is attached to addiction and unlike alcohol, um, alcohol is illegal and it's socially acceptable. Drugs are um, not. And there's a strong genetic connection. Um, Kathy and Debbie's dad died of alcoholism at 52 years old. Um, addiction today is widely recognized, recognized as a disease of the brain. Today's findings show most who struggle with substance abuse disorder um, also, have, also have multiple um, maladies as depression and, and anxiety and bipolar disorder. We're sure now that that was the case with Nicole because Kathy went to counseling and she had talked a lot about Nicole and the counselor said she was bipolar and that runs in our family. So um, we're pretty sure that that was um, what happened. Nicole's counseling started as a teenager and that was over you know, 30 some years ago. And I don't think that they had the tools then or they didn't recognize young kids with depression like they do today. So we attended a Naranon meeting during our first, um, Nicole's first rehab. And we met a woman named Karen, and she turned out to be a best friend and a mentor, and she traveled this journey with us. She pushed Kathy to start a meeting at Hope Church here. And I mean, we're not joiners, we're not club people, we don't, you know, we're not on bowling leagues, we just, that's not us, so it was out of our comfort zone. First couple meetings are about six people, and uh, we're driving home, and I'm going, yeah, this is kind of a flop, I don't know. And, the next month we had 25 to 30 people. So think about that. Through Naranon, Kathy helped coordinate the start of Narcotics Anonymous here, and Karen started something called Narateen. Narateen is a special program. It's for teens from 10 to 18 that have parents that are struggling with addiction. What you find is a lot are in prison, a lot are missing in action. Most of these kids are being raised by their family, by grandmothers. Um, that um, is a really sad thing for somebody that should be enjoying high school and prom and everything else. And their kids are, their dads are in prison or their mom's in prison and they're gone. So Naranon gave us the tools and very important tools um, to navigate the waters of addiction. We learned the 12 steps, just like somebody struggling from alcoholism or addiction. We learned how to restart our day. We learned how to live in the moment and find peace in the middle of angst and chaos. And we learned how to detach with love. That was the hardest thing for me. How do you detach with love? So it really became all about being there for somebody and not doing for somebody. So 2004, I asked you to kind of remember that date and we circle back. In the 90s, a family called the Sacklers, who owned Purdue Pharmaceuticals, came up with a marketing plan to make oxycodone as prevalent as aspirin. I hate to assign homework, but if you get the chance, please watch Dope Sick with Michael Keaton. It is spot on, it's accurate, and it's such a powerful story on how we got here and why I'm standing up here today. 
In 2004, when Nicole had her accident, Oxy was just beginning as a mass epidemic. The Sacklers hired a guy named Chris Wright from the FDA. He was making $86,000 a year. That was back in the, probably the late 90s. They paid him $4,000, $400,000. So think about that. He was hired to navigate the waters for the FDA for the Sacklers so that they could get approval for Oxy. It was mass marketed to physicians. The message was unlike on the other opioids on the market. Purdue's Oxy was time released and it had a 1% addiction rate. That was a lie, that was a deadly lie. Yeah. In 2003 to 2007, there was this concept of pill mills. People would travel from out of state, Florida was a mecca for pill mills. So there are strip centers, you've got a doctor that's writing scripts that's just on the take, it's cash only. So if you had cash, you could walk in and buy Oxy and walk out. People died. My daughter stood in those lines. In 2022, Oxy's still prevalent, but there's a new epidemic and it's called fentanyl. How we got here was um, the state of Florida and several other states created a database so that if you had a script and you went to CBS, you get the script filled and they'd say, you just got a script filled last week over here. So I talked to Nicole about that. She goes, it's just gonna push people to heroin. And that's exactly what happened. Fentanyl is such a risk for children today. Um, some facts for you. In 2021 to 22, in one year, there were 108,000 overdose deaths and 78% were based on fentanyl. The DEA has seized over 4,000 pounds of fentanyl. This is staggering. It's enough to kill the entire population in the United States 10 times over. A speck of fentanyl on it, the size of a pinhead can kill somebody. Kids buy pills off of Snapchat. That's the biggest medium for um, drugs. And a lot of these pills are counterfeit. You can't tell they're made by the same presses that pharmaceutical companies make. They're produced in Mexico and sent across the border and they end up uh, on the streets. If your pharmacist at CVS looks at a Xanax and can't tell from a counterfeit from a real one, how can you, how can your kids, kids take them and they drop, they drop dead instantly. My daughter dropped dead instantly. So Nicole died of fentanyl poisoning. Her detective stated that even though um, she acquired the drugs, she was murdered and the district attorney in um, St. Pete pursued a murder to charge against the people. So I was an IT guy and that one managed to break her, her Android phone and Google's got this GPS service. And with location-based services, there's even a map service. So we, we downloaded the maps and were able to track her whereabouts seven by 24. So we saw her going from our house in Tampa at midnight um, sometimes three times to St. Pete and back to get drugs. And it was the same apartment, and that same apartment had the two guys who were on Nicole's speed dial. Um, they started to pursue the charges against these guys, but karma worked swiftly, and, and, and I'm, I'm, I have to admit I'm happy. The detective called and he said, I have to give you an update. He goes, the two guys that were suspects were shot to death last night in a drug deal gone bad. So there you go. Uh, so about Nicole, you know, I'm talking about all this bad stuff, but I've got some really cool memories of Nicole, early memories. Um, she was a pretty normal kid. You saw the pictures. I mean, she's like any other kid, um, pretty independent. Um, Saturdays were cartoon and big time wrestling. She loved wrestling. She was, she and I were glued to the tube and it just generated eye roll after eye roll with Kathy. Like, what are, you, what are you doing to my daughter, right? So she knew Andre the Giant. She knew everybody by name. Dusty Rhodes, Ric Flair, Hulk Hogan. One day a friend called me and said, hey, I've got four tickets to WrestleMania at the Pontiac Silverdome. So I surprised Nicole. We were way up in the nosebleed section, but this was kind of pre predates the Jumbotron, but they had the big screen and we were right there. We screamed and laughed and we cheered. And then came Andre the Giant. Now, I don't know if you 
know anything about Andre the Giant, but he's seven foot five and almost 600 pounds. And he squared off with six midgets. <laughs> so these guys, I swear, came up to it, came up to his knee, and they were jumping on him, and he was throwing them, and we were laughing. It was great. On the way home, she said, "This is the coolest day." And then she said, "Yep, I do know it's fake." <laughs> and I said, "Well, I thought it was real." I mean, come on. <laughs> So then came the Bon Jovi phase, oh boy. She was like nine years old, loved Bon Jovi. So I surprised her with tickets to a concert in downtown Detroit. Um, she told everybody at school and we went and I should have thought through it because it was sold out and I got a little girl and it's just packed. So we had really good seats. We were like six row center. I put her up on my shoulders because everybody was standing. He started out with living on a prayer. It was so loud, but it was so good and my pants were like vibrating from the base. It was just, and, and then all of a sudden I feel her squeeze my neck and she's crying and she goes, can we please go home? Oh, so took her home, halfway she just stood with her head down, or sat with her head down and then she said, please don't tell anyone, especially Ronnie. She had a crush on Ronnie, so she didn't want him to know. So we moved to Tampa and Kathleen, work most every Saturday. So my morning routine was to go for a couple mile run, walk the dog, cut the grass, jump in the pool. Nicole watched cartoons and Kathy got ready for work. When Kathy would leave, um, Nicole and I would go to Hooters for lunch and she would have wings, fries, and a Coke every time. I'd have a half a dozen oysters and a cold beer. One day she looked at me and she goes, that is so disgusting. I, I, I go, so you want one? And she nodded and smiled. She said, what do I do? I said, well, the best way is crystal hot sauce, horseradish, a little bit of lemon and a fresh cracker. So we finished two dozen. <laughs> um, Kathy came home and Nicole came running up and said, we ate two dozen raw oysters. And once they get another eye roll, she's gone, jeez. <laughs> so those are some of the memories that I'll cherish forever. Um, unfortunately, our later memories were not as many and not as prevalent, but we had some great memories from from the past when she was growing up. Kathleen had such a bond and connection with Nicole, it's a mother-daughter bond that made them inseparable. And uh, there are far too memories for me to recall. Um, and many predate addiction. Some of the fondest of late were when we attended Grace Church and um, Kathy shared Joyce Meyer with Nicole. So Nicole became a Joyce Meyer fan and they talk about it. She's going, did you see Joyce Meyer's YouTube video last night? Um, they went and saw Joyce at an event in Tampa and Nicole really liked it. She struggled with her demons and she believed in God and she prayed every night and she said that she prayed for us. So here's a young woman in pain beyond comprehension and she's praying for us. That was selfless. So life after death. I talked about how the story has a middle, beginning, a middle, and an ending. For Kathy, now we have our new beginning. It's crazy that our beginning started closer to the end, but that's just the way it is. Um, we look forward to our life together. Sadly, it's without Nicole, but she'll always be with us. And we've together, been together for over 40 years and married for 36. Um, we have that special marriage. We were the couple that never fought. Um, I had a connection with a high school friend on Facebook and she said, I'm so jealous you guys have like the most perfect life. Um, she didn't know behind the scenes we have survived hell. Nicole so loved us. Our marriage has been blessed beyond belief and we continue into our golden years, I guess. <laughs> so we'll have matching walkers. <laughs> Unless Kathy dumps me for that 20 something year old long haired <laughs> pool dude next door. I have to admit he looks pretty cool. He's got dreads and stuff, yeah. Anyways. So Nicole would want us to live our life and that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna enjoy our beautiful cottage up north. We're gonna travel some and we're gonna honor Nicole every day. So thank you.